Okay, hello and welcome to today's event. We're excited to, excited to kick off a new Dynamics AX educational series today in partnership with IBIS, a longtime Microsoft Dynamics AX partner and solution provider. I'm Jason Gumpert, and we are joined today by Matt Alford, an AX consultant with IBIS, who is here to talk about Warehouse Management 101. Matt's a first-time presenter for us. We are really glad to have him joining. And as we get started today, I just want to add that we do invite you to ask your questions during the presentation. Matt will make time at the end to take those. Please use the Q&A block that you see to the right of the slides to enter your questions in. And uh, without further delay, I'm going to now hand things over to Matt. Hello. Um, my name is Matt Alford, and welcome to the our webinar on Microsoft Dynamics AX Warehouse Management 101. Um, again, my name is Matt Alford. I've uh, been in the distribution field for over 15 years. Um, spent a lot of time uh, running warehouses um, over that time frame um, and have varied experience um, within the distribution field, operations, and logistics. Um, tell you uh, a little bit about the company that I work for, um, give you a little bit of background on the host of the AX Educational Series. IBIS is a Microsoft Gold Partner focused on Dynamics AX, CRM, and GP. IBIS has been in this business for about uh, for 26 years, and our strength is in the supply chain space, and we're, we're really focused on client care and services. Um, our objectives for today, uh, in this webinar, we have two primary objectives. Uh, first, to describe the functionality of the warehouse management module in Microsoft Dynamics AX to you, and to introduce new concepts and terminology. Uh, the specific topics I plan to cover are listed here on the screen. Uh, we'll start with an introduction to warehouse management. Uh, we'll get into warehouse setup and layout. We'll talk about uh, product setup requirements, and then we'll get into some of the more specific topics, uh, reservation hierarchies, location directives, work templates, mobile device setup, outbound order processing, cycle counting, and production. Warehouse management is an important part of any logistics operations for a company. Uh, by using a system to help you manage your warehouse, you gain visibility and can work to streamline processes and, and inefficiencies. Advanced Warehouse Management provides a variety of business processes that are supported for both inbound and outbound processing. This includes sales orders, purchase orders, and transfer orders. In addition, uh, miscellaneous warehouse operations are supported for cycle counting, inventory movements and adjustments, quality control, and production operations. All this functionality is guided through a mobile device uh, to make the processing more efficient and easy for your warehouse workers to learn and use, which is important. The functionality is all configured directly in the AX client, which makes for seamless integration, and the system is highly configurable. The large variety of configurations do add some complexity to the initial setup, but it allows for simplicity and execution. As we begin, I want to take a look at a typical inbound process flow. So uh, a typical inbound process flow will begin with issuing a purchase order, uh, then the goods uh, will arrive at the dock, and we would register the receipt. From that point, we would transport the goods to the inventory location where they would be put away. Now a typical <clears throat> outbound process flow begins with a sales order where inventory would be reserved. Uh, from that point, the sales order would be released to the warehouse where it would be picked. Uh, the picked order would then be staged typically for some type of packing, whether it's been packed into a container or packed onto a pallet. And at that point, the shipment is loaded onto a truck. Uh, let's begin with warehouse setup and layout. We'll first talk about zones and zone groups, location type, location format, and the locations themselves. Zones are a breakdown of warehouse locations into logical groups. Uh, for example, 
perhaps you carry hazardous materials such as paint or aerosols and you need to keep those materials in a separate location of the warehouse. Or perhaps you simply need to separate larger heavy items like furniture into a separate section of your warehouse. These are examples of zones within the warehouse. What we're looking at here are zone groups. In my example, I've broken down the warehouse into five groups, such as my hazmat area, quality areas, uh, which are used to store goods on quality hold or items waiting inspection, and I even have uh, staging areas. I may use staging areas to store received goods to be put away, for example. Here we're looking at warehouse zones. You'll see that each zone begin or belongs to a zone group. For example, my hazmat zone group is now broken into two zones, one for picking hazmat items and another for storing bulk hazmat items. Warehouse locations will later be assigned to zones. This, particular, this is particularly useful if you want to ensure that certain items are stored in certain zones when they're received and put away. For example, if I receive a shipment of paint, I want to ensure that it's put away in the hazmat bulk zone and not my standard bulk zone. Another good use for zones would be if you have workers picking outbound orders from different zones. For example, workers in one picking area may work with carts uh, where they pick into totes or shipping cartons, but in another area, the warehouse workers pick orders with forklifts. These zones would be useful in uh, dividing up the picking work to the correct users. Now let's look at location types. You can have as many or as few location types as you want. This is used to categorize locations, which can be useful later when querying locations of a specific type. For example, you may have picking locations for your hazardous items in a separate zone from the picking locations for your standard inventory. But both locations are still picking locations, regardless of which zone they're in. Uh, the location format allows you to specify the naming convention for a location. In the example shown here, our location format called Rack is set up so that the aisle number is two characters long, followed by a dash, then, two then a two-character bay number, followed by another dash, then a one-character shelf and a one-character position. And at the bottom of the details section of this form, you'll see an example of what the location format uh, that we just designed would look like where it shows the two zeros, a dash, two zeros, a dash, and another two zeros. In a moment, we'll generate uh, location numbers using a location setup wizard, and you'll see more examples of this location format. Here's some additional warehouse setup. Uh, the dock management profile restricts what can be mixed on a dock at any given time. For example, uh, do we allow mixing of waves but not mixing of loads? We'll discuss waves later, but a quick note on the difference between a load and a shipment in AX. A shipment is typically an order or a group of orders shipping to the same customer, such as Joe's Flower Shop at 123 Main Street in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, a load is typically a single shipment or multiple shipments that will be shipping with the same carrier. So the shipment to Joe's Flower Shop may be added to load number one, which also includes six other shipments all being picked up by the same carrier. A dock management profile then would allow you to restrict the mixing of loads, for example, on your dock. Uh, this would prevent order shipping uh, via carrier X from being mixed with orders on the dock shipping via carrier Y. Uh, we also have location stocking limits, which allow you to define the maximum quantity that can be stored in the location. You also have the option of unlimited quantity, which would uh, be used more for a fluid location, such as a dock, where quantities are always fluctuating. Fixed locations allow you to define a single fixed location for a specific item. So if we don't want to allow an item to be stored in multiple places, we want to ensure that it always remains in one fixed location, we could do that. Here we see location profiles, uh, which bring a lot of this data together in one place. For example, you may have two areas of your warehouse that are used for storing bulk hazardous materials, but one area has rack locations that are three feet high, and another area has uh, racks that are six feet high. Um, both groups of locations would, would be in the hazmat bulk zone, but they would be a location type, uh, and both would be the, the same location type of bulk, 
they'd have the exact same location format so that they ha use the exact same uh, naming convention. However, because the dimensions of the two locations are different, and therefore they can store different quantity of goods or goods of different sizes, they need to be separate location profiles. In the example on the screen here, you see we have selected a location format and a location type already. We've also selected other parameters, such as the ability to use license plate tracking um, and cycle counting on these locations. But we're not allowing mixed items, for example, or mixed batches within a single location. So we've set different parameters. Uh, at the bottom of the form, you see that we can define the physical dimensions of the location. This will allow AX to direct users to put away newly received goods into the uh, most optimal locations based on the dimensions of the location. Here's the location setup wizard that I mentioned earlier. Now that we have created a location profile for our new bulk locations, we need to generate the location names. We could do this manually, but since this area of the warehouse that we're working in uh, contains hundreds of locations, we prefer to use the wizard to do the work. We have selected the warehouse, the location profile, and also the zone that these locations will belong to. Notice that once the location profile is selected, the naming convention from the location format appears on the screen. Now you simply need to enter the range of locations you want AX to create and then click Build. Once that's been done, you will receive an info log displaying which locations have been created. On the left side of the screen, you'll see the range of locations that I created. They begin with location 01011A all the way through 12104A. And then again, that's based on the criteria that we entered onto this form here. Uh, there's some additional product setup that must take place in order uh, to use advanced warehouse management in AX. First, warehouse management must be enabled for all storage and tracking dimensions that will be used for products that will be stored within a WMS-enabled warehouse. So um, warehouses within AX uh, need to be enabled uh, for the WMS. That, that's one additional change. So if, if you are using a WMS-enabled warehouse, you need to also uh, enable uh, warehouse management for your storage and tracking dimensions. Once this happens, the pallet ID dimension is no longer used, and license plate and inventory status become required dimensions. Now, a license plate is a number assigned to a container. That container could be a pallet, it could be a case or a box, or it could be a plastic tote. So whatever you're storing your inventory in, it could be a, a license plate. So you could have um, one license plate on every box within the entire warehouse, or you could have multiple boxes on a pallet and have one license plate on the entire pallet. So that entire pallet then would be a, a unit of measure, and it, and it would you know, move throughout the warehouse potentially as one unit. The inventory status dimension, um, this essentially eliminates the need for quarantine management. Um, this allows you to divide items into categories based on the status of the inventory. You can create an unlimited number of statuses, and you can define if the inventory is blocked. You see the inventory blocking field on this form. So, um, for example, uh, the, the screen I have displayed here, you'll see that the top inventory status available uh, does not have the inventory blocking field checked, uh, whereas the quality status below it does have that field checked. So if we have any inventory in the um, with an inventory status of quality, that inventory is blocked and, and cannot be used for any type of transaction such as picking. You can set a default inventory status for the entire legal entity. Uh, so if your legal entity has multiple sites and multiple warehouses, you can set one default for that um, legal entity and it will apply to all sites and warehouses beneath it. Or uh, alternately, you could uh, set a default inventory status for each individual site or for each individual warehouse. You can even specify a default inventory status for a particular customer or vendor. Um, if you want one vendor's inventory to always be received under a specific inventory status, you could do that. 
You can also define an inventory status all the way down to the item level if you choose to. Uh, you can change the default status on the mobile device or on the purchase order or sales order or the transfer order line. So if you issue a purchase order to a vendor and the status, um, the inventory status on that purchase order line is available, but you want to change it to a different status, you could do that on the uh, actual purchase order line. The unit sequence group determines the units of measure in which warehouse work is generated. This is set at the item level. In the unit sequence group shown here, an item could be purchased or sold in three units, each case or pallet. As you'll see in the unit field, EA stands for each, CS stands for case, and PL stands for pallet. However, if you notice, um, if you look at the parameters to the right of those three units, you'll notice that the default unit for purchase orders and for transfer orders is each. But users can cycle count the item in each's or cases. This will allow a cycle counter, for example, to toggle between each and case um, the, those two units of measure on a mobile device. So they have, um, for example, you have four cases and one open case that has three loose eaches inside that case, you could uh, cycle count the three cases in the back as cases and the one open box is three eaches, or you could uh, cycle count that entire uh, pallet um, as eaches. It gives, gives you some options. Um, filters. These are optional, but they can be used on location directives, which is something we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, if you want to put away a type of item into a specific zone. For example, any item assigned to the chemical filter that you see here on the screen could be configured to be put away in our hazmat zone. Uh, or items with the perishable filter could be configured to be stored only on ground level locations in the aisle closest to the quality area. This would make it more efficient to perform regular checks on expiration dates. So you can, you can use these filters in a variety of ways. Filters can also be set on the item group form, which allows new items that are assigned to that item group to automatically inherit the filter. So if you have one specific item group for your chemical items and you assign this filter to that item group, whenever you create new items and assign it to that item group, they automatically inherit the chemical filter. You can also configure items to either be generally available, meaning they could be available to any customer, any vendor, or you could have it limited to only specific customers or specific vendors, all based on this filter. So um, if you want to limit the sale of certain items to a certain group of customers, you could use filters to do that. Reservation hierarchy, um, this is a hierarchy of storage dimensions used for reserving inventory. The dimensions you see here on the screen, site, warehouse, inventory status, location, and license plate are all required dimensions for every uh, reservation hierarchy. There are two that you don't see on the screen here, batch number and serial number. These are optional, and they only need to be included if they are used in in the associated tracking, di tracking dimension group for an item. The elements in a reservation hierarchy determine which dimensions will be recognized when the actual reservation of inventory occurs. The location of an item is identified by the warehouse management system. Typically the dimensions in the hierarchy that are listed below the location are determined in the warehouse, um, for example, at the point of picking. So in the example listed here on the screen, the only dimension listed below location is license plate. That, that way uh, you can direct a user to the location, uh, but allow them to choose which license plate they're actually going to pick, as long as it, you know, that license plate belongs to the same uh, inventory status and item that, that, they're, that they're picking. You do not need to provide the location in uh, the dimensions that are listed below location when you actually enter the order. However, if you want to make a dimension required at the point of order entry, that dimension would have to be moved above the location hierarchy, uh, would have to be moved above the location dimension within the hierarchy. For example, 
Uh, if you have a product that customers usually order from the same batch number every time, and the batch number, and you want the batch number to be determined when the sales order is entered, you'd want to create a reservation hierarchy where the batch number dimension is listed above location in the hierarchy. Um, here's an example of a reservation hierarchy, or where, rather where it's being assigned um, at the item level. If you notice the red circle, uh, that reservation hierarchy button uh, will actually um, present the user with this um, screen listed below it that says assign a reservation hierarchy to the item, and this is actually where you would assign the reservation hierarchy to the item itself. Uh, this screen shows um, a form that allows you to change the reservation hierarchy for items that already have transactions against them. Um, this is a batch job that can be accessed from the warehouse management module. So again, if you have items that have already, uh, where you already have transactions, um, you, you've already sold this item in the past, and now you want to change the reservation hierarchy, you would have to do it through this batch job. Now let's talk about location directives. Uh, this is this is a new term um, in Dynamics AXR3, specific to the warehouse management functionality. Location directives are user-defined rules that help identify pick and put locations for inventory movement. Uh, pick and put are important, and, and we're going to talk about them more as we go along. For example, in a sales order transaction, a location directive would determine where the items will be picked from and where those items will be put. To be more specific, an item could be picked from location 01-05-3B, so a specific location, and the user could be directed to put the item in a staging area where it would await, pick, uh, await packing. So that is your pick and put example. Picking from a location and putting a staging area for packing. You can also use location directives to do the following. Put away incoming items, pick and stage items for outbound transactions, pick and put raw materials for production, or to replenish locations. So if you are replenishing picking locations from your bulk inventory, you could direct a user to pick from the bulk location and put into the picking location. This is the location directives form. Uh, here you're able to define parameters such as where an inbound item is taken for put away or where an outbound item is picked from and then where it's taken to. Notice there are three sections. In the top section, which is called the location directives pane. Um, this section is used to determine which location directive a task qualifies for. Notice the edit query button that's highlighted in green. This query will be used to specify criteria. If any order line meets these criteria, then AX will move to the second pane in the window or on this form, which is called the lines pane. For this particular location directive to determine uh, which unit of measure criteria the order line meets. Once that is determined, AX then moves to the final pane at the bottom, the Location Directives Actions pane. And this is where AX will determine what specific action must be taken. I'm going to look uh, a little more deeply into each of these panes here in just a moment. In the upper left corner of the Location Directives form, you'll notice um, a field called Work Order Type and it's set to sales orders. That means that this specific location directive that we're looking at uh, applies only to sales orders. So there are other work order types for purchase orders, replenishment, um, transfer orders. This specific one that we're looking at applies only to sales orders. Also notice uh, in the upper left-hand corner uh, in the location directives pane that there's a sequence number field the sequence number field is used when determining which location to, to direct um, which uh, location directive that the uh, that AX is going to follow for the specific sales order. Um, AX will first 
check the query that's been configured for the location directive in sequence number one. If that sales order line does not meet those criteria, AX will then move to sequence number two and check the query for that location directive. And that will continue through all of the sequence numbers until that sales order line does meet one of the criteria. Now let's look a little more closely at the location directive query. Here you'll see that we created criteria for sales orders to qualify for for this particular location directive. Uh, you'll see the sales origin on the sales order line must not be set to INET, which is an online service that our, our company receives sales orders through. The sales order line must also not have the customer group of big box and the items. Um, and on the item itself, the code one filter must not be set to hazmat. So if a sales order line meets all three of those criteria, um, then we've then AX has found the correct location directive and it will move on to the next pane in the location directive form, um, which is the location directive lines pane. Um, here AX must determine if the sales order line's unit of measure and quantity meets the restrictions put in place. See the restrict by unit button highlighted in green. Uh, here you have the option of setting multiple units of measure for this location directive line if necessary. We'll say that the sales order line was placed with a unit of measure of pallet on this particular order, meaning that the customer's ordered one pallet of, spe of a specific item. We'll also say that that unit of measure meets the restrictions that we've put in place here for this uh, specific location directive line. Uh, we would then move on to the final pane on the, um, on the location directives form, which is called the location directive actions. This is where AX will determine which locations to pick the item from. Notice the edit query button is highlighted here. This query can be used to specify which locations this sales order line we picked from. Here's the query form that, that we just uh, spoke about. Notice we have specified a warehouse and a location profile of bulk. We could also have chosen to specify a zone instead of a location profile if, if we chose, or any other criteria for that matter. Uh, since the sales order unit of measure is pallet, we now want the, the user to go and pick these goods from the bulk area where the pallets are stored. So um, the location directives, again, are being used to find which criteria the sales order line in this example meet, which criteria they meet, and then once we've determined what unit of measure the sales order line um, is set under and what quantity, if there are any quantity restrictions put in place for that, um, that unit of measure. Once, we've, once AX has determined all of that, it, it then goes to this last query and determines where to pick the pallets from. So in this specific example, we're telling AX to um, pick the pallet from warehouse number 24, uh, any location where the location profile ID is set to bulk, and any location where the physical inventory is greater than zero. And then we'll allow AX to uh, go out and find the correct uh, pallet to pull. Now let's talk about work templates. These are used to create and process warehouse work at various stages in the warehouse management process. A work template can be created for any of the activities listed on the screen. You can specify which location directive to use, but if you don't, uh, Microsoft Dynamics AX will search for a location directive using the sequence numbers and queries that we discussed before. Here's an example of a work template. Notice the work order type in the upper left corner is set to purchase order. After a purchase order is received, a work item will be created to direct a warehouse worker to go and pick items from the defaulted receiving dock and follow the location directive action to put the item away in a particular location. The location directive determines where the item should be put away. The work template determines which user or group of users has access to this task. On the far right of the screen, notice there's a work priority field. 
This allows you to prioritize some tasks above others. This is particularly helpful if you have workers who perform multiple tasks. For example, perhaps you have a worker who performs cycle counts but is also needed to help replenish picking locations. The replenishment task can be given a higher priority so that those tasks take precedence over cycle counting for that specific user. All work that is created will be displayed in open status on the work details form, which is what I'm showing you here. This allows management to review all work tasks. Work details also provide transaction history since the, since the item, location, and quantity are all captured on the work instructions and can be viewed even once work is closed. Uh, see the user actions button highlighted in green. This button will display additional information such as the user who performed the work. This data will allow you to track and report on labor statistics. Um, workers can also be organized into groups and assigned to shifts to keep track of when and where they work. Uh, use AX to estimate how long work should take and then record how long it actually takes. In a complex warehouse operation, you may use multiple staging operations. For example, after items are picked from the warehouse, they may require a complex packing operation to prep the goods for shipping. After the items are packed, they're staged at a dock door for loading. With the example you see here, you could create three pick and put pairs to track the movement of the item through the various steps. The first pick and put pair would move the item out of the picking location and into the packing location. The second pick and put pair would move the item out of the packing operation and into the loading location. The final pair would move the item out of the loading location and onto a truck. So you're picking it from one location and putting it into another. Uh, to make this work in AX, you would need to configure a work template with the correct pick and put pair. And you would also need to create location directives to indicate that items should be placed in the packing or loading locations respectively. These would then be linked to the work template to indicate where the items should be placed. Disposition codes are a collection of rules that are used when damaged items are received. For example, when a worker uses a mobile device to receive items that were damaged, the user must scan a disposition code or enter a disposition code for damaged items. Uh, Microsoft Dynamics AX uses the disposition codes to assign an inventory status to the product and generate a work template. AX then searches for the location directive with the same disposition code to determine where to put away the returned items. For example, you may want to use a disposition code called quality uh, that will allow a worker receiving goods to determine that the inventory needs to undergo a deeper inspection to look for quality issues. This disposition code could then trigger work to pick the item from the receiving dock and put it in the quality area. Mobile devices are a key part of any WMS. In AX, you should consider the following. Uh, work classes are used to define the types of work that a mobile device can process. Device menus are used to outline which options are available to a user. Device layout allows you to, de to define information such as font and color, uh, mapping keyboard shortcuts, and even the date format to display on the device. Device users define the people or workers that can access the mobile devices and what level of access is required. And print settings allow you to control the layout the printer, and the template that would be used for printing labels. This is the mobile device items form. This is where you create a menu item to be added to a mobile device menu. The highlighted menu item is called sales picking. And we'll see that again here in just a moment. This is the function that a worker could use to actually pick sales order lines. The mobile device menu contains the menu items that a warehouse worker will use to perform their work. You create the structure of the mobile device menu by adding menu items or other menus to it. When you add a menu to another menu, 
all of the items, the menu items that were contained in that the menu uh, that you added will also get assigned to the, uh, the parent menu. So for example, you might have a master menu that contains several sub-menus like inbound and outbound, for example. If you've already created the outbound menu, once you assign that to the master menu, all of the uh, menu items that were contained within that outbound menu would be assigned to, that, to the master menu. Uh, you can configure, configure menu items to do the following. Uh, process an inquiry or perform an activity such as printing a label, generating license plate numbers, or starting a production order. You can create work that will be performed through another process, like receiving an item for a purchase order. I can create put away work for another worker. Then you could also perform work that was created by another process. So in the example we just gave, uh, you could perform the put away work that was created by a different user when they received the purchase order. Here's a look at the mobile device menu form. The menu I've highlighted is the outbound menu. Notice in the menu structure pane in the bottom left corner, you can see the menu items assigned to this menu, including the sales picking menu item that we talked about earlier. Also note that you can limit what functions a user has access to by creating custom menus for that user or a group of users. So in the example we're shown here, uh, there are five menu items in the lower left corner of that screen. Uh, sales picking, sales loading, cluster pick, create, cluster pick, and transfer pick. So if you didn't want to, or you wanted to restrict a user from having uh, the option to pick transfer orders, for example, you could create a second menu uh, for that user or that group of users that did not include the transfer pick menu item. Now let's talk in more detail about outbound order processing. This begins with wave picking. Wave picking is used to assign orders in groups or waves and release them together so as to allow management to coordinate several parallel activities that are required to complete the work. For example, in a shipping wave, work would include picking from multiple locations or even from multiple units of measure, like pallets and cases. It would also include packing and staging to be completed and for those orders then to be moved to the dock for loading onto a truck. The individual orders chosen for the wave are dependent upon criteria that's used uh, to make that selection. So you might select uh, multiple sales orders that all belong to the same chain of retail stores, for example. Uh, you could use that criteria to as assemble all of those sales orders onto a single wave and then do all of the picking together. In AX, this is all done through the use of a wave template. There are three types of wave templates, shipping, production, and Kanban. Uh, we'll be focusing on the shipping wave templates today. There are several benefits of wave picking. It allows you to organize orders with similar criteria. Um, like I mentioned uh, a moment ago, orders from multiple locations of a single retail customer or if you have items shipping um, via the same carrier, like uh, UPS Ground or FedEx Ground, if you want to um, collect all of the orders shipping via a ground carrier, you can uh, assemble them all in a single wave. Waves help you stay consistent with customer routing requirements, as well as any loading uh, or planned departure times of the carrier. Coordination of waves helps to reduce the space required on the shipping dock for assembling and loading orders. Waves allow you to assign staff to each wave and each function within a wave with the expectation that all the work assigned to each wave will be completed within the wave period or whatever period of time you give it. Uh, this provides management with the ability to monitor and manage performance throughout the day and respond in a timely way to any problems that occur. This also allows management to more effectively utilize staffing throughout the shift. Uh, this is the wave template form. It's used to control how a wave is executed. Multiple wave templates can be creative, each with different properties. When you first create a wave template, required base methods are created as steps for that template and appear in the lower left grid, which is highlighted in yellow. Then you have optional wave execution methods for replenishment and containerization. 
you notice they're available in the lower right grid. Those can be manually added to the wave template if they're required. In other words, since this particular wave template that we're looking at does not include replenishment or containerization, in this, if this wave method or wave template rather were to be used to create a wave, replenishment and container, containerization would not occur for that wave. Here's an example of the wave workflow. First a wave is created, then shipments or loads are added to the wave. Once the wave is processed and the creation of work is verified, the wave can be released. Once it's released, the work is available on mobile devices. If desired, the wave can be left open and not released. You could then process it again. Um, you could add more shipments to it before releasing it, or you could cancel the wave altogether and add those shipments to a new wave that you created at a later time. Also feel it's important to mention that AX provides functionality for cluster picking. This allows a worker to pick multiple orders at the same time. The cluster will organize the picking work for the worker. For example, if a worker picks four orders on the same cart and all four orders require a similar item to be picked, the worker will be directed to pick that same item for all four orders at the same time, reducing the number of stops at that location from four stops to one stop. If needed, a worker can pass an unfinished cluster to another worker. This might happen if work for a cluster spans over two different zones of the warehouse and each worker picks only within their own zone. Again, this might happen if two different zones require different equipment for picking. If, for example, one zone is picked on foot by using a cart and another zone is picked uh, using some type of forklift like an order picker or cherry picker. In that instance, you might have to uh, pass a cluster from one zone to the next. AX also allows you to set up a default company policy for sales order fulfillment rates. The policy controls the percentage of the total price or of the total quantity of an order that must be reserved physically before a sales order can be released to the warehouse. You can also set up a policy specific for a customer. So if, if you don't want an order released to the warehouse until it's 60% or 90% or 95% uh, fulfilled, whether that's based on uh, the dollar amount or based on the number of units. You, you can do that through a, a fulfillment rate policy. You can set up a batch job to automatically release sales orders to the warehouse. The fulfillment rate policy for sales orders is applied once the orders are released. You can also set up a batch job to automatically release transfer orders to the warehouse. And you can specify selection criteria and the order in which transfer orders are released. Now let's talk about packing. Uh, containers represent the physical structure in which products are packed during shipping, and you can keep track of the container information in the system. Container types can be used to create descriptions of containers, which include maximum values uh, for the physical size dimensions and weight capacity of a container. When a containerized wave is processed, the containers are created based on the container type information. This can be useful during transportation planning, for example, especially in the case where shipping charges are calculated based on the containers or the size of the containers. You can see the number of containers that are used in a shipment, the types of containers that are used, and the physical dimensions such as total volume, total weight, and so on, for all prior to shipping. The system provides a packing process that allows you to validate and pack products in the containers. In this process, warehouse workers pick products from the storage locations and move them to a packing station where they check the item quantities and types and then assign them to the appropriate containers. When a container is fully packed, they can close it and move it to the outbound dock for shipping. The manual packing process always starts with a sales order or transfer order, again, the manual process. Work is then created through a wave that has the, pa um, that has the packing station as the put location. So uh, items are going to be picked and then from, the, from the warehouse and then put at the pack station. 
After the items are in the pack station, a user opens the pack form and creates a container, packs the items, closes the container, and then weighs and prints documents. Uh, this cycle continues for each shipment. This is the pack form. While items are being packed, the packed quantity and remaining quantity columns that you see in the lower section of the form, uh, these, these two sections or these two columns are updated while items are being packed. When a line is completely packed, it will be removed from the open lines tab but can still be viewed on the all lines tab. In each packing action, the system validates the total item weight inside the container against the maximum allowed weight of the container. The maximum allowed weight is specified for the container on the container type that we talked about earlier. If, if the uh, product that you're packing into this container exceeds the limit, the system will prevent the item from being packed into that container and displays an error. However, the system does not validate any other physical dimensions such as volume, width, height, or length. This allows for flexibility during packing, so you can accommodate situations where you can adjust the dimensions on the product. For example, a packer might be able, might be able to nest two different items inside of each other before uh, packing it into the container, even though the uh, volume of the items would, would exceed the volume of the container itself. Automated containerization creates containers and the picking work for shipments when a wave is processed. To set up containerization, you must create the following. Container type, which defines the physical characteristics of the container. Length, width, height, for example. Uh, container groups specify the sequence in which containers are packed and the fill percentage of each container. So, for example, do I want to fill containers only 90% of their volume to allow for some type of packing dunnage? So you could have paper or some other type of dunnage, um, foam or peanuts or anything like that that you put inside the container. You might want to allow for space. Uh, container build template defines rules for containerization. For example, can inventory be mixed in a container, inventory of different types? Can it be mixed in a container? Uh, you can also set up a rule to prevent order lines uh, from being, um, from different orders rather, being packed in the same container. So if I don't want to allow, um, even if it's two orders from the same customer, but I don't want to allow two different, or order lines rather, from two different sales order, even though it's for the same customer, to be packed into the same box, we can, we can configure that. And we have wave templates which create the picking work for the containerization. Upon processing of the wave, containerization executes the following steps. The system creates containers for the order line. The system then checks physical dimensions of an item to see if it fits in the container. AX will then uh, rotate an item on its z-axis, meaning side to side. It'll rotate it from side to side or flipping the length and the width of, a, of, a, of an item to see if it'll fit in that container. Um, it will not flip an item on, on its X or Y axis. In other words, it won't flip it upside down. So if you have an item that must be uh, shipped standing up, whether it's liquid inside, for example, um, we, wouldn't allow, we wouldn't want AX to flip it upside down and have the liquid come out. So that, that uh, doesn't happen. It will, however, um, rotate it on the Z axis, like I said, side to side, to see if it'll fit into a container. If an item does not fit, AX can be configured to split the item into smaller quantities if that's possible and see if those smaller quantities would fit into the carton. However, if a single item cannot fit, uh, the containerization process for that line will fail. The line will still be assigned to the container, but the container will be created with a field that's called uh, container has errors. Um, that field will be enabled on the carton. Um, that indicates that the containerization process failed and, and some type of action will need to be taken to make sure that it fits into, the, into a container before shipping it. Uh, if the dimensions do meet the requirements of that container, the system then checks the weight and volume of the order line against the maximum allowed weight and volume of the container, taking into account any container utilization percentage that's set on the container group. So again, if we only want to fill it up to 90% of the volume, then then the system is going to verify that it um, fits within that 90% rule. The system will then try to downsize 
the order line into smaller containers uh, defined within that container group based on the prioritization of uh, containers that you created within the group. And when a container uh, fails to downsize any further, AX will stop trying to downsize and assign it to that or assign the order line to that container. So in other words, you might have four different containers uh, ranked in order from largest to smallest. Uh, AX will attempt to fit uh, an order line into the largest container. If it fits, it then tries to fit it into the next smallest container all the way down so until it gets into the smallest possible container, allowing it um, to maximize or optimize, rather, the use of shipping cartons. That'll help reduce space usage, help reduce freight costs, especially where package dimensions are used for pricing. Um, for example, if you're shipping it out with UPS or FedEx parcel, um, the dimensions are used for pricing. So we obviously want to get it into the smallest possible container. Also helps reduce the time it takes for workers to pack by determining the cartons ahead of time. You can even um, determine the cartons ahead of time and have pickers pick into the cartons. And this, all, this whole process would repeat, by the way, uh, until all order lines on the wave have been containerized. Uh, replenishment. There are two types of replenishment in AX. There's a min-max replenishment and demand-based replenishment. Min-max replenishment is based on the minimum and maximum stocking limits of a location. So now we're talking about replenishing a location from uh, bulk storage. So say we have a picking location for an item, and if it's set to minimum, maximum, or min-max replenishment, then we're going to fill it once it reaches a minimum level. So let's say, for example, a location holds 100 units, and the minimum is two. Once uh, the demand on that location has um, reduce the inventory in that location or the potential inventory in that location to two, which is our minimum, it will then attempt, the AX will then attempt to replenish the location up to the maximum. The second type of replenishment is called demand-based. This, uh, this will create replenishment work only when a, uh, a picking location does not contain the inventory that's needed to fulfill a pick. So in the same example I gave you, there's a hundred, uh, or rather, a location that can fit up to 100 units, um, but currently let's say we only have 10 units in the location and uh, we run a wave and the wave requires 12 units to be picked, which is more than what um, is contained in that location, uh, AX would then generate work to fill that location either equal to or above the 12 units that are required. The, this is a replenishment template. This form allows you to define which replenishment type is used and what the parameters for replenishment are for selected products or locations. Notice there are buttons highlighted in yellow and green. These buttons are used to define which products or locations qualify for uh, the specific replenishment parameters that we're looking at. You have the option of not defining products or locations and having these parameters work for all items in all locations. In this example we're looking at, though, uh, we see um, examples of the um, product selection and location selection queries on the replenishment template. So in the image at the top, we've defined specific items or specific products um, that will follow this replenishment template. And in the bottom example, we've specified specific locations that uh, will will be replenished using this, this specific replenishment template. Cycle counting. Uh, this is a warehouse process that you can use to audit on-hand inventory items. You can even define workers that will approve or reject cycle counting work before it is posted. So you can send people out to do cycle counts, but it's not going to get posted. Um, uh, you, no changes will actually happen to your inventory, nothing will be posted to your, your GL until uh, a supervisor has actually reviewed it and then either approved or rejected the cycle count. And if the cycle count work is rejected, uh, you can uh, reassign it to a different worker. Um, you can, there are also parameters uh, which will allow you to set a threshold so that if a user's out 
counting an item, for example, and let's say the system believes there are 10 units in a location, but the user says, no, there's 100. You know, maybe there really are 100 units in the location, or maybe the user just hit the zero button twice by mistake. So by setting up thresholds, you can even prompt the user immediately to recount that location to check for errors before submitting it to a supervisor for approval. CycleCount thresholds and CycleCount plans can be used to generate CycleCount work for you. Workers can also perform uh, spot counts on problematic locations. Um, so spot counts meaning it's not, they're not being directed to go there, but they choose to go to that location manually and actually count the item. Uh, this does not require work to be created in advance. This, the worker simply scans the location and performs the count. Um, a cycle count threshold indicates the quant quantity or percentage limit that inventory items must reach in order to generate cycle count work. Um, so if a location falls below two units, for example, or once it hits two units, we want to generate a cycle count. Uh, a cycle counting plan is set up to create cycle counting work immediately or periodically. You can use a query to define item or location criteria. In the example on the screen, the items defined as part of this cycle counting plan will be counted every 30 days, but a maximum number of 10 cycle counts can be created at a, at a, at a given time. You can also use a batch job to generate cycle count work for you. Guided cycle counting allows a user to manually create a list of items or locations to be, uh, to be counted. That work can then be created and assigned to a user. Once a cycle count has been performed and approved, the counts would then be reviewed by a supervisor. Our final topic today is production. Uh, some additional setup is required if you use warehouse management processes for production. After production order is created and estimated, it can be released to production and, a, and items assigned to a production wave. Picking work is then created for production orders. The difference between production waves and a shipment wave is that you can allow production waves to be released to the warehouse without fully reserving inventory. This is useful when enough materials are available to start production but not enough to complete it. However, you have the option of requiring full reservation if, if you prefer. In the production orders form, you can use the release button to release the order to the warehouse and create wave lines for the bomb items. You can also use the release to warehouse button uh, when the production order has a status of released, so it's already been released, and, but you want to re-release it or release additional materials to the warehouse. Once a production operation begins, the required material must first be moved to designated areas on the production floor. There are two ways to accomplish this. One way is by material staging. This process involves moving full pallets or handling units of any kind to the place that they will be consumed on the shop floor. The alternative is pick to order. This method involves picking the discrete quantity needed for an order and moving it from the warehouse to production. In the example on the screen, there will be five materials used in this production order. Um, the first three will be staged to the production input location using pallets. The remaining two materials are picked based on the estimated quantity required for the finished good that we're producing. Location directives are then used to determine where the raw materials are picked from and where they are staged um, and where the finished goods are put away. Uh, after the raw materials have been moved to the input location for the resource that will consume them, you can start the production order. You can do this by using the production orders form or by using a mobile device. When reporting goods is finished, the mobile device can be configured to have the user who is reporting the goods is finished also immediately perform the put away, or uh, you can have that user stage the finished goods for another user to put away. The put-away location can then be determined by the worker if they are putting it away themselves, or we can have the worker be directed by AX to a specific put-away location. And this actually concludes 
our my, uh, Microsoft Dynamics AX Warehouse Management webinar. My contact information is displayed on the screen here, as well as information about IBIS. Um, feel free to contact me anytime if you have additional questions. I'd be happy to answer them for you. Um, let's see, uh, Jason, I guess I hand this back over to you to see if we have any additional questions. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have a few questions that have come in. Uh, thanks a lot, Matt. And I want to uh, just remind folks that they can ask their questions now. Please use the Q&A block that you should see to the right of the slides to, to ask your questions for Matt. I know he'll, he'll uh, stick around here for a little while longer. We've had, just to maybe start off, I've had uh, a couple of folks ask about the event being recorded, and it has been recorded. We'll be making that available to you um, uh, with an email alert uh, once it's ready. And uh, now, yeah, a few questions have come in. Um, I think there's one here that you actually can't see, so I'll, I'll start with that one. It came in a little earlier. Can locations begin with a non-numeric if you build them in the location wizard? Uh, it can be if you specify the non-numeric character as um, a fixed um, a fixed character. I'll see if I can find that slide and go back to it, but. Let's see, it's, let me see if I can get back to slide 16 here. Uh, if you notice, hopefully you can still see this, if you notice there's a um, column called static text, um, and the last um, line on the location setup wizard here is the position location. I actually include the static text of A because typically AX is only going to allow you to use numbers. So the first three lines, you see I'm using numbers from 1 to 12, from 1 to 10, from 1 to 4. And then on the, the bottom section, my positions are uh, alphabetical characters. So I have to uh, use a static text of A, um, and the character length is 1, so it, it only requires me to enter in one character here. And this is going to create all of the locations that fit within these numerical ranges but they'll all end with the letter A for my position. And since all of my racks have two positions, A and B, I would then change that static text to B and uh, click Build again. It would create all those same locations, but with uh, the position being B. Okay. Um, can you create work without reserving goods? Can you create work without reserving goods? Uh, no, I believe the reservation has to occur ahead of time. All right. Um, for the mobile device function, is that part of the WMS module? Yes, it is. Uh, in your slide, you said uh, Pallet ID is disabled for advanced warehouse management. Does that mean we cannot use Pallet or just cannot track by Pallet ID? If your warehouse is, um, if, if it is enabled for the advanced WMS functionality, then you cannot use Pallet ID. It essentially is replaced by the uh, license plate number or LPN. It's, just, it's essentially the same thing. Um, but um, you have to use LPN functionality in the inventory status, or those two dimensions, rather, with a WMS-enabled warehouse and not the Pallet ID. All right. Um, can we set how to circulate in locations for picking operations? And can you say that again, please? Can we set how to circulate in locations for picking operations? Meaning? I assume we, we mean in what order we're picking goods in. Um, I assume that's the case, but yes, you can um, you can define the order in which items are picked, so going through a numerical sequence throughout the warehouse. So, um, for example, typically in warehouses, um, you, you want your pickers to move up one aisle and down the next, and then up the third and down the fourth and so on so that they're moving efficiently, but you can um, you can configure uh, the system to um, uh, assign the picks to a worker in, the, in that sequence. All right, great. And the, the person who asked the question confirmed that was the right assumption there. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, so there's a question about the mobile app. Is the AX mobile application a web page catered for a small screen, like the Motorola symbol type of handheld barcode scanner? Uh, yes, it's it's um, configured for uh, a small screen. And, you know, I believe there are multiple um, platforms that it can be used on. Um, I don't know the specifics of exactly which platforms um, will work, but if if you uh, want additional information on that, um, you can just let me know, and I, I can dig into that a little deeper and, and let you know specifically which formats. All right, great. And um, before, we have a couple more questions. I just want to um, jump in and remind folks, um, we are recording today's session. We'll be making uh, that uh, recording available and send everyone an email alert when it's ready. Um, also, look for a survey at, at when you do leave today's event, and we do have a couple more questions to cover here. There's a quick survey. We really appreciate the feedback uh, for how the session went. Our, fee our speakers always appreciate knowing how they did as well and what they can, uh, what people are finding valuable. Uh, so, if a um, if a raw material needs to be added after the production started, can we create work for these additional raw materials? So, raw material that was not part of the original bomb. I assume, um, I, let's see, so the, the production wave has already been released without the raw material now. And I, you'd, you'd go in and um, you could manually create the work. If we're talking about pulling an additional raw material to the production area, you could manually create um, work for that one specific raw material, yes. All right. Uh, here's our, let's see, I think we're down to our right, or um, I guess the alternative that this person just, just uh, added here, or if extra quantities are needed. Yeah, you can do that manually, yes. Manually, okay. Um, and we're down to our final question here, so I'll just make a last call for anyone else who has anything. Um, is there any provision to maintain case numbers or pallet numbers in, um, in pack form or in packs? Case numbers or, or what else? Or pallet number in pack form or in pack from. Sort of in, uh, looks like there may be some typos in this uh, question here, but. Okay, read it to me one more time, please. Okay, is there any provision to maintain case numbers or pallet numbers in, in pack form? I'm not sure if you were talking about the pack form, meaning the form we use to uh, pack goods. Um, I believe so. So case number or pallet number. So maintaining that within the pack form. Um, let's see. Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, but again, that's something I could probably look into a little more closely and see if uh, see if um, that's there. And I'm just not aware of it. But I'd have to look into that a little more closely. But not that I'm aware of, no. All right. And one more here. If you have a fulfillment rate based on quantity. Does that mean you can only release to the warehouse when that customer orders that quantity amount? Um, you could configure it to do that, yes. If you have an automatic batch job running to release the orders, it, it would only release it if they ordered that quantity, yes. But you could manually override it and release it yourself. Can registration plates for locations be used in conjunction with other location IDs? License plate, license plate, can you read that again, please? Yeah, can, can well, they use the term registration plates, but for, uh, for locations be used in conjunction with other location IDs? Um, well, the, within the system, you know, you're only going to have two um, two types of, um, I guess, location identifications, for lack of a better word. One is the actual LPN or the license plate that's on the, the product itself. And then on the location itself, you're going to have your location number. So whatever we create in the location wizard will be the location number. The only, um, I guess, caveat or the only addition to that is that you can set up um, check digits. Um, which are essentially invisible digits that are built into the barcode but the user can't see. That way they can't manually just type in a location, say the 
you know, your mobile device is telling a picker to go to a specific location, but they don't want to go there, and they just type in the location and pick it from somewhere else, which is going to throw your inventory off, you can enforce a user to actually scan the uh, barcode at the label by enforcing or by uh, adding check digits, which are system generated but invisible to the user. So I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but um, to my knowledge, that's the only, um, uh, I, I guess, the only other number you can use in, in conjunction with uh, location numbers that are created with an AX. All right. Um, is there any out of the um, are there any out-of-the-box mobile menus configured and which types of uh, mobile platforms or mobile devices are supported? Um, the types of devices supported, I, I can't say specifically. Um, I know, um, I believe it's um, one, one of the Apple um, devices, and I forget which one off the top of my head is supported. Most RF technology is going to be supported. Um, I can't think of one that isn't off the top of my head. Um, but if, if you have a, a specific one in mind or you have a couple that you're choosing between, um, you know, again, if you, if you reach out to me and let me know what they are, I could, I could investigate that for you. Um, and the other part of the question was, was what, again, other than the platform? Um, are there any out-of-the-box mobile menus configured? Oh, um, yes. Um, they're, they're simple menus configured, yes. Um, basic menus, I should say, for um, shipping and receiving. All right, great. Um, we have one more question here. Uh, and Matt, maybe you want to put your contact information back up as we kind of close out here. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, so um, is it possible to have mobile locations to use for trolleys and other um, items while stock is in transit? Uh, yeah. You could essentially think of that as your staging location. So you could um, say a user's picking from one location and staging it onto a cart or a trolley or, or whatnot. And then as long as you have a barcode on it, you know, or some something, I guess it wouldn't have to have barcode. You could manually type it in. But as long as you have some some type of a location that um, specifies that trolley. As, as a location within AX, then you could locate it to that trolley, and then you get another um, um, set of work tasks to pick it from that trolley and put it into whatever other location you need to take it to the dock or to a packing area or whatever. Great. Well, we are through our question queue. Thanks to everyone who's still on the line and for asking so many questions. Uh, and Matt, of course, thanks for uh, for joining us today and for presenting so much uh, great information to us. No problem. And, and again, feel free to reach out to me if you have additional questions. Yeah, Matt's contact information is on the screen there. With that, we are going to conclude today's session. Again, please do look for the survey when you close out. Uh, with that, I will say thanks and have a great day. All right. Thank you.